Hello, this is Leslie Suters, and I want to share a presentation with you from um, called Integrating Programming in the Primary Science Classroom, Yes You Can, for the TSIN 2022 conference. Um, we have several faculty from Tennessee Tech that will be sharing. Um, myself, Jennifer Meadows, Stephanie Richards, Perry Han Fadon, and Stephanie Wint. Then we also have um, a couple of Tennessee Tech pre-service education students, Chelsea Danford and Adrian Hanna who will also be sharing. Um, we're gonna share mainly activities that you can use based upon computational thinking that you can use in your classrooms. Um, computational thinking is a set of problem solving methods that involve expressing problems and their solutions in ways that a computer could. It involves the mental skills and practices for designing computations that get computers to do jobs for us and explaining and interpreting the world as a set of information processes. So I'm gonna share four components of computational thinking with you. And I want you to be thinking of ways that you think this applies in your classroom in math and science and STEM. Uh, the first component is decomposition. So asking students to break down a problem into smaller parts. The second component is pattern recognition, looking for similarities within a problem. Third is abstraction, identifying the important information and ignoring distracting information. And algorithms are developing the step-by-step -step rules to follow in order to solve a problem. So I think you can likely see a lot of ways that this applies um, throughout the curriculum, um, in particular STEM classrooms. Now, um, Weintraub and his colleagues developed a computational thinking in mathematics and science taxonomy um, in 2016. Um, there's four major categories, um, data practices, modeling and simulation practices, computational problem solving practices, and systems thinking practices. Within, if the, in, within each of these categories, there are several um, sets of practices that apply to computational thinking. Um, you can see that in data practices, this is something that we use um, every day um, in science and math classes. So collecting data, creating, manipulating, analyzing, and visualizing. Um, I also want you to notice the connections between um, science and engineering practices and um, cross-cutting concepts with these um, CT practices. Uh, you can see um, using and, and working with models. You can see um, oh, systems, thinking of a, a group of parts that make up a whole and thinking through that um, with computational thinking. Um, and with computational problem solving practices, this is where we often think of programming um, and the ideas of debugging and um, coming up with algorithms um, and uh, working through those types of problems. But computational thinking includes all of these categories, not just the programming. So our state has um, K-8 computer science standards, and we, um, we have a, a good number of, um, of coding and computer programming um, standards at each grade level. And so I was, wanted to share with you a few from the K-3 level, since that is where we're focused on with this particular presentation. So at the kindergarten level, um, you can see that students are asked to define an algorithm. They're asked to decompose an, out, an example problem, and they're asked to do this collaboratively. Um, and I think that you'll see that throughout across each grade band is that students are supposed to work together and um, use engineering design and so forth to solve problems. <clears throat> First grade, they construct an algorithm. They're working with data. Um, again, the collaborative um, task. They decompose larger problems. Okay, so you can see those components of CT built into our standards. Um, and they compare positive and negative effects computer technology has in, um, in our lives, okay? And identify ways that um, hardware is used 
in software is used by, by our groups and how it might be used differently by different people. So what can CT look like in our classroom? Um, we want to use it within our disciplines. We don't necessarily want to just try to teach computational thinking as a um, standalone course within, um, within their computer lab, okay? We wanna do it in our classes. So within math, um, they might decompose whole numbers or shapes. They may, they look for patterns in algebra. Um, they may program robots to model geometric shapes. They may use simulations. They often decompose word problems to understand the context. So, and that's just a beginning. So, and they don't even have to use technology to do these um, practices. They, um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. We're gonna showcase a good number of technology and technological tools um, to use with computational thinking, but they certainly can do this unplugged without a computer. In science, they may program a robot to solve a problem. Um, they may um, describe step-by-step -step procedures they use for answering a question or solving a problem. They'll use cross-cutting concepts like looking for and describing patterns, use cause and effect. Um, and they also may look at a system or model and describing the parts that compose it. Um, science and engineering practices, they will certainly analyze and interpret data and look at using grade appropriate tables and graphs. So one um, tool that you can use in the classroom is called a Codapillar. And that's one that we're not gonna showcase in one of our later sessions. So I wanted to share a video with you um, and it shows children using this tool. Do you know how to code? And there's a question mark, so we know it's a... These preschoolers at King Elementary are too young to write computer code, but they're old enough to begin learning some of the basic elements, starting with an algorithm. Can you say algorithm? Algorithm. And one more time, what do you think an algorithm is? It's a step by step. Finn here is right. While we may think of an algorithm as a complicated mathematical equation, at its heart, it's simply any step-by-step -step procedure, no matter how simple. Um, and it's like maybe putting together a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or it could be anything that we do that might be a set of directions. Today's set of directions is to program Cody the Codapillar. Cody has multiple body parts to tell him to go straight, left, or right. They made Cody move. And that's called algorithm. Aiden's enthusiasm was matched by the adult helpers from the VPS curriculum and technology departments who were excited to try something challenging and new, working with preschoolers. They helped students set up Cody's start and finish disks, and it was up to the kids to put the body parts in the right order to get the right result. First, they programmed Cody to go straight to the star disc. I love it because I want to the star. Once they mastered that, they programmed Cody to curve around the discs. This lesson was created in collaboration with the curriculum and IT departments and early childhood educators. It may not be obvious, but this exercise teaches kids how to plan out steps to accomplish an objective. That's a skill used every day in coding, math, and lots of other areas. I really believe that not only are we giving them the opportunity to learn computer science, but we're also providing them an opportunity to develop uh, the skills to be tech literate. Of course, there's another goal. So I want them to go home and tell their parents that they had a great time at school. And the helpers in Ms. Yamamoto's classroom took all the steps necessary to achieve that objective. What did you think was fun? Uh, everything. Good. Good, you guys. Okay, so I think it's great to be able to see children using these tools and using some of the terminology. Of course, they don't have to use all of the terminology, but that is certainly something that's appropriate. Um, another tool yeah. stop it, is um, a Code and Go robot mouse. Um, so let me share a little bit about this tool. kids to code develops essential STEM skills and opens up a world of future possibilities. And learning to
to code is as easy as Ready, Set, Cheese with Colby, our programmable robot mouse. Simply pick an activity card and recreate the featured maze. Once it's built, use the coding cards to plot a step-by-step -step path for Colby to find the cheese. Each card features a direction or step, such as forward or reverse, to program into Colby. Next, enter the sequence of steps using the color-coded buttons. Press the green start button and watch Colby race to find the cheese. If he doesn't quite make it, simply add the needed steps, reposition Colby, and press the green button to start again. Colby automatically lights up and squeaks when he reaches the cheese. Program additional special effects using the flash symbol card and red button. Make a wrong turn? Push the yellow button to start over. Want more challenge? Don't use the coding cards or try building your own maze. Watch students problem solve as they construct their own variety of mazes. The possibilities are endless since Colby can be programmed up to 40 steps and features two speeds for either tabletop or floor. Race one at a time to see who can reach the cheese in the fewest steps possible or add a second mouse sold separately for more learning fun. This deluxe set includes everything you need to provide the perfect hands-on introduction to coding and early STEM concepts. Enjoy a fun, easy, and affordable way to add an hour of code or more into your classroom with Colby, the Code and Go programmable robot mouse from learning resources, perfect for ages five and up. Okay, so in the rest of the presentation, uh, you will see some different tools brought to you by different uh, presenters, and I um, want you to be looking out for an Easter egg about how to get one of these Code and Go robot mouses for free. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Meadows and I want to talk to you a little bit about the Beebot. The Beebot is a fairly small robot. You see it easily fits in the palm of my hand and it has very few commands. There are seven buttons on the top so it makes it fairly easy for our students to use. On the bottom we have power switch and a sound switch. So when I press the sound or the power switch, let's see what it sounds like. You saw a, a lighting of its eye and you saw a little beep. The buttons on the top also make some noises. If I get tired of those sounds, I can easily switch off my sound on the switch on the back. To charge the Bebop with our chargeable batteries, we use a, just a simple USB cord. So I'm going to go to the online version now to show you some more about the Bebop, what these buttons mean and some things that we can do with our robot. So this is the Terrapin homepage. Terrapin is the parent company of Beebots and several other robotics as you can see here in the, the, the pictures. First we're going to start with the Beebot. So um, the Beebot, you can see it runs around $90. Um, the Beebot, here's some different uh, images. And we're going to stop right here as looking down on the Beebot to talk about these buttons. So the orange buttons are our direction buttons. Our Beebot speaks in a language of code. So to make it move, we're going to say, here's our eyes. So we know this is going forward. This looks kind of like a stinger to me. This is the backwards. And then these side buttons are actually going to ask our Beebot to turn 90 degrees. So if we push this one, it'll turn 90 degrees to the right and this one 90 degrees to the left. Now we can press these buttons all day long and nothing will happen until we push this green go button. That tells the Beebot that we have finished our codes and we're ready to run the program. These blue buttons are also important. Start with this one over here. This is the pause button. When we are putting in our commands and we want our Bbot to stop, this button will ask our Bbot to pause for three seconds. This one with the X is an extremely important button. This tells our Bbot to clear the existing programs, to clear the existing commands so that we can create a new program with new commands. Here's an image of our blue bot. This is the blue bot and our Bbot. The blue bot's a little bit more sophisticated in that it can um, be programmed with a computer as well. Um, I forgot to mention that our blue bot can actually hold 40 commands, so it is pretty sophisticated by itself. 
Now we can use our VBOT or BlueBot on carpet, on tile, on um, a desktop. I find it works best on low pile carpet. Uh, that's typically the, the room here at the STEM Center that we use, but it'll work on lots of surfaces. You can also use mats, and I frequently use a mat with my VBOT. This is the one that you can purchase from Terrapin. They, they actually have several others as well, but this one is one that you can customize. There's a clear top on it that you can lift, a grid on the bottom that are six inch squares. That's how much the Bebop moves each time is six inches. And you can put cards on this grid to tell the Bebop to where to go or for kids to, to know where to go to program their Bebop. I wanna show you some um, mats that I've created for events here at Tennessee Tech STEM Center. These mats were used to show different ways of showing the same number. So here I've got one digit, two digit, um, some two digit um, numbers on this next one, uh, four digits and even some three digits. We just have variations. So with this game, I guess I could call it, uh, the students would pick a card and then they look for different representations of that same number. So maybe if they chose the card 104, they would look around the board and find another way to say 104. So maybe they saw this dollar bill and four pennies and they know that's 104 cents. So maybe starting here on the brown blob with their Bebot, they could move forward, forward, forward three times to land on another representation of 104. Now I have a clear top. This was created with laminate that I just taped on the back. The base of my mat was, you. I used uh, poster boards, two poster boards, putting them together and just drew the grid lines on and then just ran the whole thing through the laminator. My cards, I just taped those on and then put the clear part down on the top. That just allows our Bebop to run smoothly without uh, tripping up on the cards. So you may be saying to yourself, this sounds great and I'd really like to try this, but I don't have a Bebop in my classroom. I'm gonna let you know in on two ways that you could actually use this Bebop without purchasing one. One is to get a physical Bebop from the Civil Air Patrol. The Civil Air Patrol is a wonderful organization that you can join as an educator for $35. It's a one-time fee that can be renewed annually for free. Once you are a member of the Civil Air Patrol, you have access to a lot of different aerospace education programs. This includes curriculum and various um, STEM kits. That's what we're gonna look at. So I'm on the aerospace education tab. Let's see, I'm looking for, let me go to educators. I think that's it, yep. I'm looking for STEM kits. Here we go, free K-12 STEM kits. There are various items available that you can request from Civil Air Patrol through a very simple form. I think it's about one page. Then they will send you the kit. You use it with your students, maybe take a couple photos, fill out the reflection form, which again is about a page or so, very short, very manageable, and they'll send you another kit. Here is a listing of the current kits that are available. This is the Bebot and Code and Go mouse. They come as a pair. And when I got mine, I know they also sent um, the mat. So I don't know, they're always changing, but that's something that you might um, consider. Lots and lots of things are available. I know Sphero is mentioned in this um, session as well. There's a Sphero. There's just all kinds of things that you might be interested in. The other way is on the Terrapin website under products, you can go to free online resources. And we have an online VBOT emulator that is absolutely free where you can allow your students to use a VBOT online. See so here's the VBOT and it's on currently an alphabet map. I can switch up the map to different, or different maps that are available. You can see we've got lots of different skills that could be practiced.
I'm going to stop here at the school mat and ask my bot to go to the restroom. So I see the restroom is over here. How could he get to the restroom? So my bot's going to need to go forward, turn to the right, forward, 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 turn to the left, forward. Let's see if that can get our bot where it needs to go. So I said forward, turn to the right, forward, 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 turn to the left, forward. Notice as I put the commands into the bot, they show up down here. So I could always clear it and start over if I see I messed up. Let's press go and see if the bot does get to the restroom. Excellent. We could have our students go to different places, even making stops along the way. Remember, this button is the pause button that would ask the bebop to stop at a certain location before going on. So you can see there's a wide variety of things that you could do with these maps. And there are also lessons available as well. Most of the lessons are not free, but you can definitely find lots of free lessons available online as well. Speaking of, I'd like to share a resource that I found that is particularly helpful, helpful from an educator named Della Larson. Della Larson has been teaching for well over 30 years and loves to incorporate technology in her kindergarten classroom. In this link, Della has a YouTube channel with a specific playlist about using BeeBots. If you're interested in learning more about BeeBots and how to make your own maps and various activities that you can do with them, check out Della's YouTube channel and her BeeBot playlist. Thank you so much for listening to our session today. Hello, my name is Chelsea Danford, and this is my partner, Adrian Hanna. Today, we're going to introduce you to Dash the Robot, and we're going to go over some great ways to incorporate him into your classroom. The big concept of our presentation is that coding can be incorporated into all subject areas, and Dash is just one tool that you can use, but he is, in my opinion, the best tool for elementary age children. Um, they target, Dash's targeted age range is 6 to 11 years old. And we are going to introduce you to the Blockly app. It is one of the coding apps available to use with Dash. You can get the app on your Apple or Android devices, but you can also go to the Make Wonder website and access it from there. So I'm going to go ahead and come over here. So they actually just released this feature, and it's called Dash's Neighborhood. When you're using the web app, you can actually see Dash virtually you don't have to have the robot with you or in front of you to test out your code. So to show you how to code, I'm gonna go over here. So you start with this block. So it tells him when to start doing his actions. So I'm gonna have him drive forward 50 paces. Hmm, I'll go with the sound. So I'm gonna have him do a fire siren and I'm also gonna do an animation. I'm gonna have him dance for you. And I'm gonna click here on confident and you can see you can change the different, um, the different dances or sayings or many of the aspects you can change and adjust to fit what you want him to do. Yeah, uh-huh. This is part of Dash's appeal to elementary children and teachers. Yes, we had so much fun when we were introduced to Dash last semester and just about everybody in our cohort took him Dash home, home. Yeah. <laughs> just to play with him. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how we can use Dash on Dash's neighborhood to test our code without having the robot in person. So I'm going to hit play down here in the bottom left. Yeah, uh-huh. He's so cute and your students will love using him. And they may even see it more as a game than actually learning or doing content, learning content. 
doing content area projects. It's amazing what you can do with him. Yes. So one of the biggest issues some teachers have is how do I use it? How am I supposed to teach how to use it? Well, one wonderful thing about Dash is they offer puzzles for him. So students can actually go through these puzzles and it will teach them how to code using Walkly. Some of the other apps actually have it to where students who don't have the, like for instance, students that are in kindergarten, it has a remote control setting. So they don't actually have to go through and do it step-by-step step with the blocks. That's just one way you can easily accommodate for those students or students who don't have, you know, they're not on level or have difficulty with the blocks. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to our presentation here. Chelsea and I taught a lesson at Willowbrook Elementary over the life cycle using Dash, and we really enjoyed teaching the lesson and the kids, they loved it even more. They could not wait to get their hands on Dash as soon as they saw us they walk in wait. with the box. They, the robots are here. Exactly, it was so much fun to see their expressions and how excited they were. So before using Dash in your classroom, we suggest setting up expectations or rules for how to handle Dash, how to just basically respect Dash. He is our friend. He is here to help us and he wants to enjoy learning just as much as we do. Yes. So our rules that we set were be nice to Dash. Do not pick up Dash by his head. His head does come off. He's, it's the only part that really moves. It turns around. So it would be really easy to, to hurt Dash if you picked him up by the head. Yes, for sure. It's also important that they're very careful carrying Dash so he does not get dropped. And then finally, as with any electronic device, you should not have food or drinks around them because he has electrical components. So we started with the kids. We, we preloaded websites for them and gave them each worksheets and they could pick within their group if they wanted to research a chicken, a frog, a ladybug, or a butterfly life cycle. And then we would let them take turns picking code to use for Dash because Dash needed to go around their poster in the proper order of the life cycle. And then finally, we let them test their code. Yes, and when we had the posters, we went ahead and pre-sketched out the actual pattern for the life cycle. And then they had to cut out the different parts of the life cycle, yes. color them in, and then paste them into the proper order. We were on a time crunch, so that was a way for us to save time. Yes. So this is an example of what one of the human life, well, the human life cycle poster that we made as an example for our students. So as you can see, Dash will follow, he starts with baby, and then he's going to follow, go to toddler, child, teenager, adult, and elderly. So the the order that they had him go in had to follow the order of the, the life cycle. And it, the hardest part for the children, I feel, or the students was getting him the proper, like setting him to go the proper length. Yes, it was hard for them to figure out what angle does he need to turn to stay on the poster. But I mean, that's hard for adults. It's all about the learning and the fun you have while doing it. And some students, they picked it up within the short amount of time we yes. were there. They had it going and they actually, we offered extensions. Uh, we had them try to have them go around it twice, just, you know, something to give them more opportunity to work with Dash. Um, there we are with our first group of students that morning. That's the second grade class. Uh, these guys had so much fun with Dash and the fighting was very minimal. Uh, I was surprised. Yeah, we definitely expected to have to do more behavior management. Because we only had one dash for each group. So they had to share, but it worked out very well. And I really do think that us setting those expectations yes. to start with is what made it go so well. Yes. So we would like to go ahead and say thank you again to Willowbrook Elementary for how we allowing us to share Dash with their second graders. We enjoyed it so much. It was the highlight of that semester. It really was. <laughs> so I had to do, a pro we had to do projects last semester uh, where we used 
the Make Wonder website and we had to find a lesson plan to use Dash in a different pers a different way. Like we had to incorporate a different subject, so to speak. Not just because when you look at Dash, you think science, he'll be great for science. Or just technology and stuff. Yes. So we we wanted we were wanting outside of the box, outside of the norm for what you can do with a robot. Exactly. So for my project, I decided to do a biography timeline. To the right, you can see Sunshine. We have labels on them so we know who's who. Who is who and when we're trying to connect to them all in the same class. That can get a little challenging if you don't know which robot's which. So, so the point of the biography timeline was for students to perform research about a person's life. It can be somebody that you address in social studies. It could be a scientist. It could be a mathematician. It's amazing what you can do with it. So in order to successfully perform this task, students had to incorporate voice recordings that were told from first person's perspectives as if they were that person. Then they had to include a minimum of five significant events from that person's life. And this is an optional, um, optional task but I chose to dress him up uh I did George Washington and because you can, he's adorable yes and you can see he, his hair was not cooperating that day it's just cotton balls if you're wondering this is what my programming ended up looking like wow yes it can get a bit much and if I'm not mistaken that lesson was gauged towards fourth and fifth graders so this is more realistic if they've had previous experience with him lots of practice yes like this isn't something you would want to you do on the very first day yes you don't jump in with this yes and it can get a little complicated you have to really make sure you know where is what what is which where does I mean it's it's insane <laughs> but, but the more you work with him and the more they work with him the easier it gets yes I was initially I was I had to keep thinking like oh my goodness how do I do this and then once I've got that first one done, I was like, oh, oh this is not so yeah. bad. This is actually really easy. So I think that was the biggest part was just knowing what goes where in the best sequence to do it. Yes. So I would show this video, but for time purposes, you are more than welcome to come back and watch it yourself. We should be providing the PowerPoint to you and it is linked there. So some of the benefits of using Dash for a timeline, not even just a biography timeline, he could do a timeline of the events of World War One or the, the timeline of the United States. How did it, you know, become the United States? It's amazing what you can do with him. So some of the benefits are you can use cross-cutting concepts. You're introducing coding, which is something that is becoming a high needs field today and will just continue to grow. You do basic skill building because students have to interact with them. They use their fine motor skills and they use their gross motor skills. It's very versatile. You can do just about anything <clears throat> with them and make lessons for uh, math, science, social studies, English. I mean, it's amazing what you can do. He's very versatile. And then more than anything, he's engaging. And the biggest thing about getting our students eager to learn is making something engagement or engaging. They want to participate. They want to have fun. Exactly. So this was my activity and I chose a very, this is a perfect beginner activity. This was shooting hoops with Dash. Um, and so you could use this as a, a math lesson because you have to measure out Dash's court. So how they begin is they measure out his basketball court to 80 centimeters and they mark in 10 centimeter increments with tape. Um, the coding for this is super simple, very simple. Three steps forward, add on the length. For example, I chose 10 centimeters here. And finally, you choose his launch power percentage. Um, and this was a wonderful intro for me because I was uncomfortable with the technology. Um, and I have a couple things here that are linked that you can look at later. Um, there is an actual video of Dash scoring a shot. There is his basketball court. Um, an example of my code, just three basic steps. If I can do it, 
anybody can do it. And this, um, I put this on here because this is a good ELA extension. It's really simple. Book Creator is free for you to use. Um, so I put the link on there just as an idea, something else you could do with Dash after you've taught a lesson. And the benefits for this activity was the cross-cutting concepts, introduction to navigating Blockly. This is the great, perfect first activity. Um, we're introducing children to coding. We know in Tennessee that in 2023, we are going to start implementing the technology standards and it's, it's time. I mean, we have to learn how to use these things all the time. We're in a technology society at this point. Technology drives the world. Um, but Dash is very versatile. And of course, he is very engaging. So for more information on Dash and how to use it in the classroom, go ahead and go to Make Wonders website. And we went ahead and linked directly to the classroom best practice blog. It is a phenomenal resource for learning how to use Dash, how to incorporate them in your classroom, the amazing things you can do with him. It's just, it's a, it's, it's a better way to see just how much you yes. can do with him and how valuable he is. And if you get an account, you have access to pre-made lesson plans with everything you need to implement those besides the basic tools, like in my hoops, I had to have the tape and the scissors and a ruler, but um, it's just amazing what you can do with this little guy. Yes, and the basketball setup, his hoop and his um, his goal. His launcher. Yes, his launcher and all of that. Um, that is something you buy extra. Yes. But you can't, if I'm not mistaken, you are able to get a pre-made package where mm -hmm. it incorporates those other things. He can even have a xylophone and he can do music. He can play music. I mean, it's amazing what they have designed with him. And this is just our resources. Thank you so much for letting us explain Dash to you guys. Hi, my name is Dr. Stephanie Wendt and I work at Tennessee Tech University. And I am Dr. Perigan Fidan and I work at Tennessee Tech University as well. Today our session is going to introduce you to a really cool coding tool called an Ozobot. Ozobots are great for working with K3 children because they are so easy to use. We are using the Autobots Evo, and this miniature ro ro robot has lights, sensors, and movements that are designed to teach kids how to code. So the way these work is you can download, just to get started, some sheets off of the Autobot website. And as you can see, there are dark black lines that interspersed through these dark black lines there are different sequences of colors. The colors are blue, red, and green interspersed between the black lines. So depending on how you line up the colors, that codes the Ozobot to move in a certain way, and it also will tell it how fast or slow to move. So, uh, Perry Han, would you like to demonstrate that? Yes, and there are also helpful tutorials in online and on the app that you can use. So, we have a color code charts. It will tell you uh, different kind of speeds, direction, and uh, special movements, timers, and counters. Right now, um, we are going to be just using this. So you just set the Ozobot on the line and you'll notice that as the Ozobot passes over these certain codes of color, it will move in a particular way. Each color is designed for the specific type of moment. I think that was fast. I bet we can put this one on the other end and let him start moving a certain way too. Oops, I just said him. <laughs> so that was Tornado. And so 
once the students understand the basic concept of how they move, um, that the different colors represent codes that can be uh, put on paper to make them move in a certain way. You can share a certain code with your students and then have them draw that code on paper in order for the Ozobots to follow it. So for instance, what's one of your favorite ones, Perry? Mm -hmm. My favorite is Tornado. Okay, so we're going to try drawing the code for Tornado. So Tornado is starts with black, then red, Green, red again, and green again. And then it's always a good idea to go ahead and follow your code out with another black line to continue the path. Okay, let's see how our robot will do. See, once he passes over the code, it will register with his sensors and then he will do the movement, in this case, the tornado movement. You've seen how you can draw your own codes um, as a teacher for K3 students. You might want to keep it very simple. You may want to just give them one or two codes to begin with. Uh, this is just a very introductory um, lesson to Ozobots. You can, uh, these robots can be coded uh, through drawing lines on the paper and uh, using the online programming system, Abot Borg. You can see the light sensors on the bottom and you can also download any in worksheets that you can use it with your classroom. For example, this came from the website. Um, the coding sheets that we were using are also on the website. So all of these are PDF files that you can download. And with that, we will wrap up our session on Ozobots. We hope this is helpful to you and we hope that you will explore on the website. There is an app, so once your students become acquainted with the different codes, and if you want to try to challenge them with using the app, you can do that. Visit ozobot.com. Thank you. Thank you. If we consider the ways that an app like this could be used in the classroom, um, let's just say the children know something about using the blocks to just get a character on the screen and then for instance make the character move down and across the screen now we're going to consider it an event in history or in science like the first landing on the moon so we pick a background like the moon and then tell the children to put the astronaut on the moon all they have to do is literally choose the character of the astronaut and then put the the astronaut um, where he's coming from outer space, move him down on the screen, have him move across the moon. That's what's happening here. Now a nice feature is that they can actually take a picture of their face and put it in the astronaut suit um, and it can move across the moon. There's all kind of things that could be done here, but that's just one application that could happen in this particular background with this particular um, scene. Now, they could also write about what happened, so they could um, use it as a writing um, activity as well. So something else you can do is ask uh, the students to use this grid to actually incorporate numbers and um, addition, subtraction, that sort of thing. Ask them how many uh, numbers, do, how many numbers over does the uh, astronaut have to move to get to the moon how many numbers down does he have to drop how many more is that how many less is that um, than originally anticipated how many did they think he was going to have to drop down um, and how many you know how many total is that um, that sort of thing um, you can reduce the size of the astronaut you can increase the size of the astronaut how much does that affect the uh, movement of the astronaut to get to the moon um,
So these animals could be coded to move um, across the board fast, slow, the same pace. They could be coded to be big, small, um, to fit on the screen. They could, um, you know, the children could have to select which animals belong in this habitat um, and put them in the correct habitat and, cu and, and choose the correct um, habitat from the selection of habitats that exist in the program. Um, so there's several different ways that you could use this particular um, program for, for this type of thing. This particular um, scratch has been coded to show a variety of things. The first thing we're seeing here is the frog jump up and down. He's basically been coded to jump up and down and in a second he'll begin croaking. Um, you'll hear like the forest sounds. Um, some other things you see in this particular video are each one of these characters, the snake, the, the frog, and the bat all have, have different things that they do. Um, and on this particular um, scene, the characters are programmed or coded to, um, to do whatever they're doing um, once you touch them. So um, they move once they've been touched. Um, in just a second, we'll see the, uh, the title um, come to life. And it is coded as uh, a white title on a black screen so that it can be seen more easily. Um, the bat actually does several different things. It's got three lines of coding. This could be used in science. Um, the teacher could start with the background and have the children put the things that belong in this habitat, uh, including the housing and the animals and the clothes, or um, the teacher could already have the things that belong in the habitat and then, then the children could program um, or code what the different things do, like move the polar bear, code the penguin to move, code the northerner to move. Um, it's really up to the teacher, uh, but those are a couple ideas. The children could then also um, narrate um, by way of an essay and talk about what those uh, particular things, how they belong there, what, what are some of the characteristics of those items. Um, those are some ideas. Hey everyone, so we are back with a second really cool technology tool that can be used to teach coding. Um, so these are a different kind of robots. These are called cubelets. And as you can see, they are lots of different cubes that serve different functions. So I'm going to explain a little bit with Dr. Fadon how each of these work. And then Dr. Fadon is going to demonstrate for you um, some of the different functions that they have. So the cubelets, they have all these different cubes that come in a bin. And so, first of all, you have to have a battery cube. So the battery cube, it's kind of a, it's a blue, bluish cube, and that's your power. Then you have these black cubes. The black cubes are sensory cubes or input cubes. Um, they refer to them as thinkers. They uh, process the different stimulus that comes into the cube, and they process things like light and distance. When you turn on the knob, you can actually um, measure um, how fast or slow it's doing. Yes, so it's like um, it turns up the input or turns down the input. Mm -hmm. So the cubes with the knobs do that. And so then there's also these white cubes or clear cubes. And these are the doers. They, they produce the action, um, and there are a number of different actions for each of these. And so, Pehan, do you want to show them some of the different things that these yes. do? Yes. Um, the one that I'm holding is um, Drive. So it has two wheels, and um, once you click on them, as you can see, it clicks perfectly, it will move in circles, drives, and with the knob I am measuring how fast or slow it goes, mm -hmm. okay, and another one is rotate, it has a rotate wheels on the bottom, and for this it's best way to observe 
another one and this has a light I'm going to put it on top of the rotate mm -hmm. again I can measure how fast or slow it's going to go and another way to, to do fast or slow stop and go mm -hmm. is with the sensory I believe it's this one right yes mm -hmm. so we can show that this cubelet work in the same way and this has the light sensor so when it does not have the light um, it has the light it's going to turn on fast if the, when it doesn't have the light it will stop or go slow now there are red cubes that are inverse cubes and the um, inverse cubes will make it work the opposite way. Mm -hmm. Do you want to try one of those yes. to see if we can make it work? Okay, so here's one of our red inverse cubes. Let's do it this way. So, before when there was light, it was working at the high. Now when it does not have the light, it goes it's fast. Faster. And when you add light, it'll slow down. And so then you can you can go closer and further away to adjust for that particular movement and light. Okay, it doesn't have to stay on the side. You can move it anywhere mm -hmm. that you like. There are some other good ones too. These clear cubes. Um, there's one that has a bar graph. And the bar graph will light all the way when it has full input. And then again, if you're reducing it, whether it's with the knob or mm -hmm. um, with your hand with the sensor, it can go to half. So would you like to try to show them that? Mm -hmm. So if we tried putting one of these with a knob on it instead, we can also adjust it to where it's all the way up or you can reduce it down with that knob in the same way that we did the light and with the uh, rotation cube. Uh, let's see. There's another one that makes a sound. I believe these are both light cubes, are they not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's so fun is really just letting the kids learn about the different functions of the cubes and how they have to be put together. They're learning how to build code. Um, they're learning that there has to be a certain sequence, correct? Oh, there it is. Another one we could demonstrate is <clears throat> this brown one is minimum. Let's try it with a bar graph and see if that changes the bar graph. Mm -hmm. So part of this is truly just getting it out and playing with it. Let's see if I put that one on. It's showing two with minimum. And then of course you're turning that up. Yeah, so I guess it these are so interactive. Um, they have been used at Tech with the Fab Friday event. That it's been a big hit. I know that not just little kids, but also big kids and adults enjoy playing with them because figuring out how to put the different blocks together and how and each time you add something on, it will change the output of the different functions makes it a lot of fun. The kids could sit and play for a long time with these and have lots of fun. This is the sensor. So it is similar to the light. And there's an object in front of you. And when I block the light, So as you can see, your kids will have endless fun with these. Um, I always recommend letting kids play just a little bit when they first start, just because uh, it's so much fun. And then after they have just a little time to explore, 
with these blocks, I think then you could maybe challenge them to configure um, a robot that perhaps has two functions. Each cube is a robot in itself and it becomes a bigger robot than you build it. Thank you for staying with us today and uh, we hope that this has been something fun for you to learn about.